This is the worldtomorrow.org broadcasting worldwide on the internet from the obedient church of God. By your eyes that you probably been crying for him. Yes, Father has been crying for 6,000 years because you and your ministers are so disobedient. Stars in the sky don't mean nothing to you. Genesis 1.14, lights will mark days, not phony international date lines, and not averaging calendars. Yes, the obedient church of God is standing all alone. It's the only congregation in the whole world that doesn't move God's Sabbath day to Friday in half the world. And every church, including all the Jews, follow a phony international date line which destroys God's Sabbath day in half the world and causes you to work on God's Sabbath. generation, minister after minister, leader after leader, and no one has ever obeyed. That's why the Israelites were kept out of the promised land, and that's why you will be kept out of the place of safety and have to have your head cut off. Well, that magnificent horn section, including the saxophone, ushers in the broadcast. Bonjour, Paris, France. It's evening in Paris now. Late, late supper on the East Coast, New York City. Early supper on the West Coast, Los Angeles. Paris, New York, Los Angeles. The perfect time for your spiritual feeding tonight. you listen to God's way of life. He wants it so that there aren't Catholics killing Protestants, so that everyone speaks the same thing, so that everyone can get along with every religion of the world getting along. That's why he set out the parameters way before the Koran was even written? The answer is, who shall dwell on thy holy hill? And it won't be the disobedient people that God cannot trust. Your ministers have lost their minds. 
They moved the Sabbath day to Friday with a phony 1883 international dateline. Jesus did not say after his death, move the Sabbath to Friday in half the world with a phony international dateline. What's wrong with you ministers? Why do you do it? Why? Only answer is, you're deceived by the devil. Yeshua said you live by every jot and tittle of God's word. And you cannot deny, you ministers cannot deny that in 1882 everyone waited for the sun to go down. And in 1883 all the days changed in the other half of the world and jumped ahead in 1883 moving the Sabbath day from Saturday to Friday. And you ministers won't put it back. Well, you've got to realize you've got to test the ministers and see if they're going to follow the Bible. If they don't follow the Bible, then they're following Lucifer. It's that simple. You're either following the Bible the way it's written, count seven days, you have the Sabbath on the seventh day, not on the sixth day Friday in half the world. Well, we're here to restore all things. And indeed, we have restored new month day, which should be coming up if the moon is sighted on Sunday night coming up on the 19th. That would mean Monday is New Month Day, or if it's not sighted, on Tuesday would be New Month Day. Where in Ezekiel 46.3, God states, you shall hold a worship service on New Month Day. And indeed, Isaiah 66.23 states the whole world will have a new month day service every month. You see, we are restoring all things. And we've restored the four fasts of the Lord of Zechariah 8, 19. And we are continually discovering new truths to help you understand. Today, we will tell you about the two groups of 144,000. Because two loaves are waved. Two loaves are waved on Pentecost. And those two loaves represent the two groups of 144,000. Now in Revelation 7, verse 3 starting, you'll see the 12 tribes of Israel. That's going all the way back from thousands of years ago. Now, here's the point. You read in Revelation 14.1 another group of first fruits, and they are without fault. They are without fault. It doesn't say they are from the twelve tribes. It's a different group. These two groups, here's a rediscovered truth for you, these two groups are the Bride of Christ. They are the Bride of Christ, and we'll tell you more about it as we read it. Now, at any w wedding, you have guests. So, go to Revelation 12, 13, and who are the guests at the wedding supper? Revelation 12, 13 says, they came out of the great tribulation. They did not, bear note, 
when I say bear note, that means it goes into a special book of yours where very salient points are recorded. Does not say that they came out of a place of safety, such as Petra or nearby Petra. It states they came out of great tribulation. They are the guests, but the bride is without fault. Revelation 14, 1. These first fruits are the Gentiles that are grafted in, and the key is they are without fault. And in Revelation 7, 3, you have the 12 tribes. We are the only church in the world that understands what the two loaves are, that they're the two groups of 144,000. And if you take it over 6,000 years, you will realize that's only 24 people a year. Only 24 people a year. You divide 144,000, by 6,000 years, you only get 24 people a year. So in the place of safety, it could be a very small group. Yes. And they compose the bride because they are without fault. Well, that is what waving the two loaves signifies. And we'll tell you more about Pentecost coming up and about the seven weeks, not the seven Sabbaths. There are seven weeks that you count. And we'll give you information to help you survive so that you could get to the place of safety. So you could have a place of protection. So you could be possibly the bride if 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 you are obedient if you are obedient and not a disobedient brat like all you ministers and i say that on the authority of god's bible which states you shall worship God on New Month Day, Ezekiel 46.3, and your ministers refuse. They're disobedient rats. They refuse the four fasts of the Lord in Zechariah 8.19. And your ministers, just like the poop does, your ministers move God's Sabbath day to Friday, just like the poop moves God's Sabbath day to to Sunday. There's no difference. There's no difference. Might as well follow the poop. He's got the mark of the beast. Yeah. Your ministers, hmm, they've got the mark of the beast because they move the Sabbath day. You see, God has his mark and God's mark on you involves the Sabbath as a sign, Exodus 31, 17, the Sabbath as a sign. And Ezekiel 20, 12, and Ezekiel 20, 20, Sabbaths are a sign between God and man. Revelation 14, 12, they keep the commandments, they keep the commandments of God including Deuteronomy 16.16 16, that states three times a year. Three times a year you are to appear before God at a pilgrimage feast. Not one time, three times. Three times. Your ministers don't follow the Bible. They say they do, but they don't. So who are you going to believe? God or the ministers. If you believe the ministers, you're going to go into hell just like the ministers are going to go into hell for disobedience. 
So if you want to dwell on his holy hill, you'd better think twice of what you're doing. I'm going to be telling you a lot more. We're going to help you understand God's way of life and we'll bring you up to date on what is really going on in the world. You know, you had income tax day, April 15th. Eh? That was on Wednesday. Every cent that you pay in income tax goes to the banksters to pay interest on their toilet paper that they print and call money. That's right, not one penny goes to the government. See, we the Obedient Church of God understand what's going on in the world. You know that Fort Knox doesn't have any gold in it. You know, Germany wanted its gold back. They didn't, Germany didn't get its gold back. They just asked for it last year. They asked to see the gold. They weren't allowed to see it either. You know that 66 billion in gold missing from Fort Knox? 300 truckloads of bullion were simply driven away. Here's an old newspaper headline. Show it to you on camera. There you go. There isn't any gold in Fort Knox. You see, April 15th, tax day, you're held in slavery just like Egypt. But you don't understand that. You don't realize it. You are held in slavery by a large criminal network of pagan devil-worshipping politicians. They pass laws that take 35% of your wage right off the top, 35% in income tax. They take 7%, 8% depending on what state you're in, 9% if you're in Tennessee, in state tax. Then there's federal tax, 7%. So you add that up, the 35, the 7 to 8, 9, and the 7, you get over 50% of your wages. They take half of everything, half of everything you make. And if you can't pay them, or if you don't pay them their protection money, they come in and destroy your life. We are in slavery, held in bondage by a large criminal cartel of pagan, devil-worshipping banksters and politicians as proven by the facts because not one cent, not one cent, not one cent of your income tax goes to the American government. It all goes to the banksters. Very simple. You are in slavery and you don't know it. Well, we'll try and open your eyes and show you that the only hope will be for Yeshua to come back and to free you. We'll also bring you up to date on different items going on in the world. I don't want to tell you all of them right now, but... You know, we'll tell you about Gaza, that Gaza in the Middle East is the land of the Philistines. It always has been. It's always been the land of the Philistines. We'll take, tell you what success is. Bear note, success. Success is getting what you want in life. Getting what you want in life, such as a relationship with God. We'll also talk about having a relationship with God. You know, if you have a relationship with someone, 
you don't just say good morning and good night to them and ignore them for the whole day. If you have a relationship with a friend or a mate, a husband or a wife, you speak with them all day long. You don't just say hello in the morning and goodbye at night. We'll tell you more about a relationship. We'll tell you about being heroic. Bear note. Being heroic, bear note, is taking a risk to do something important. It's taking a risk to do something important. That's what heroism is. We'll also tell you that right now you are in the dark ages. This will be looked upon as the dark ages. This is a gestalt for you to understand. You are in the dark ages now. Your ministers are hiding God's truth from you because they have you ignoring God's new month day, which will be coming up on this Monday or Tuesday, depending on the sighting of the crescent. They have you, your ministers, have you ignoring the four fasts of the Lord. Your ministers are moving God's Sabbath day to Friday in half the world. That's a fact. I can't help it. It's not me who's moving the Sabbath to Friday. Now, we have a congregation on the other side of the world at 2200 hours. Greenwich Mean Time, you go all the way around the world, and they wait till tomorrow to have the Sabbath day. But all you worldwide Church of God offshoots in Australia, and New Zealand, and the Philippines, and indeed China, and India, they all had the Sabbath day yesterday, on Friday. That means Christ would arrive in Australia before he arrived at Jerusalem. You see, you are in a dark age of, quote, Christianity. You are in a dark age. And it's not even Christianity. It's called the way. That's the term used most in the Bible is the way. Now, if you are in the way, then you're not in a dark age because you are following what we teach you. But it's worse than just the religious side. You're in the dark age now, bear note, because your leaders, your politicians, the Satanists, they're nearly all Illuminati. They're hiding free energy from you. Put some numbers on this, too. They're supporting an illegal homeland army, a homeland army that's like the brown shirts of Hitler's day, only these are the white shirts, and they're going to gun you down with the billions of rounds of ammunition that they've bought with your money. They've taken your money and they've bought billions of rounds of ammunition for the brown shirts, for the homeland security. Yes, the fatherland, the homeland, everything's the same as Hitler. And they have you supporting illegal wars around the world. They have you supporting banksters with bailouts. They have you on April 15th giving away 35% of your income, plus 7 to 8%, 9% state tax and federal tax. It's over 50%. And guess what the worst one's going to be? Number six. They're going to take 20% out of your bank account as a bail-in, as a bail-in, not a bailout, because we would hang the politicians if they, the politicians gave money away again to the banksters, because not one penny of the money given to the banksters went to pay off 
debts, it all went for more risky investment. So there's going to be a bail-in where 20% of your bank account is going to disappear. Yes. You see, you're living in an age of Satanism. You're living in a dark age right now. And indeed, you will, in the world tomorrow, realize how dark this age is, how evil. You know, there's no reason to be choking on gas fumes from cars and diesel trucks. There's free energy. There's always been free energy. There's no reason to have to pay for heating fuel at $300 a month in the winter time. Just put an aerial on the top of your roof and a ground rod in the ground and you pull the area, pull the energy using the aerial off of the earth. The earth is one great big magnet, but they're hiding it from you. They're hiding it from you so that they can take your money. You see, you're living in a dark, dark age with ministers who have lost their minds and they move the Sabbath to Friday and they refuse to stop. And they won't stand firm in the scriptures. They won't endure sound doctrine. They follow satanic practices. Indeed, they approve of Mother Goddess Day in the springtime, the Feast of Gaia, to the great whore who gave birth to all the gods and goddesses. They approve of Sky Father's Day. Yeah, leading to the longest day of the year, just like Baal's Day, the shortest day of the year, December 21st, 25th. And New Year's Day, ushering in a new year in the middle of winter because the sun god is coming back. The sun is getting bigger, so everybody joy rejoices and has a big party and calls it a new year for the sun god Baal. Your ministers all support that. Oh, a few of the ministers will say it's your choice. But they won't stand up and say, don't celebrate Mother Goddess Day, don't celebrate Sky Father's Day, don't celebrate Turkey God Day. Because Turkey God Day has nothing to do with the United States. Nothing. Oh, they'll say it is, just like Christmas, they'll say is celebrating Yeshua's birthday, Jesus' birthday, but it's not. He wasn't born in the spring, in the middle of winter. He was born in the spring. The point is, you're living in a dark age now. You're living in the dark ages and you don't know it, but we'll open your eyes. You keep tuning in to the worldtomorrow.org and we'll open your eyes. So today we'll tell you about the f being the first fruits and how you can be the bride. And the guests won't be in the place of safety. They will be the ones who give their heads in the tribulation if they're even lucky enough to do that. And then they'll become the guests at the wedding. Well, let's first now enter the throne room. So all please rise. Face the north heavens where Father and Yeshua are. Raise your arms in worship. Close your eyes in sincerity. Bow your head in humility. Almighty Father El Shaddai, we gratefully thank you for the truths that you are revealing to the obedient Church of God so that we can lead others into your ways so that they will not have to go through the tribulation. Please inspire the peoples listening so that they can understand the words we're saying. Even inspire the ministers to understand that they can't keep moving your Sabbath to Friday in half the world. It's insanity what they're doing since 1883. Father, let this be a witness against the ministers. In the meantime, our brethren 
on the other side of the world are waiting till tomorrow to start your Sabbath day. <clears throat> so, please bless our brethren. Bless the widows and the orphans in the obedient church of God. There are 34 widows, orphans, both girls and boys in total. So please help them. Help their endeavor with their making clothes so that they can help feed themselves. Help the people on the other side of the world in the obedient church of God in Pakistan. A very dangerous area. So we pray for them. Eleven of them were murdered eight years ago now by a mob of a thousand since they've been with us. They've been safe. So please continue to keep them safe as a witness. Father, it's all in your hands. We love you. And no matter what happens, we will remain true to you. Please inspire the services today, both the speaking and the hearing, and especially inspire the listening on the videotapes later when the people are listening. So now, Father, we turn the service over to your hands and ask it all in Yeshua HaMashiach's holy righteous name, Jesus Christ, our Lord and soon arriving mighty King. Amen. Yes, it's nice to have a mighty king because he is going to save us from this mess. Yes, this dark age that we're in, he's going to save us. So therefore, we shall declare all his works to all nations because he's going to take over. He's going to clean up this mess. And that's the only hope. That's the only hope. There isn't any other hope. So we'll sing praises now to the Most High. Here's our 1934 worded songbooks of the Obedient Church of God. Number one, number two. But you don't have that copy, so you'll have to use your worldwide hymnal. Turn to page nine. I will sing almost high and praise in your name. So sing out because you're praising God's name. This isn't entertainment. This is praise. This is a worship service also. So praise your father. El Shaddai with Yeshua at his right hand. And declare his work. Psalm 9, page 9. Sing out. And one moment, please, while we adjust the computer. You'll hear a sound, which means it's live again. And there it is. Declare his works to all nations. Sing it out in praise of El Shaddai.
to judge the nations because all the leaders are Satanists. You can go to our internet site and you can see it's worse than you think. Click on that gold box and you'll see all of your leaders giving the two horn devil sign. Yeah. And around the world they're all Masons. It's satanic from head to toe. Now they fight with each other because it's like a card game. And at the card game, sometimes someone shoots the other player. But the game still goes on. They're all at the same club. They all belong to the same club. And they're playing for the world's assets like a card game. Well, we read and sang in verse 2, God will rule. God will judge the world. So, he will to us a refuge be. So there is hope. Now, who will be on the, in the place of safety? Okay. Turn to page number 14. Psalm 15. And it tells you who will dwell on thy holy hill. Hymn number 14, sing out, and we'll tell you more in the broadcast, this broadcast, who will dwell on the holy hill, and how to be Yeshua's bride, and not be his guest, because the guests have their heads cut off first by man's world and have to give their lives in the tribulation because your ministers will not obey God so now they will have their heads cut off by the beast power because they won't be in the place of safety so say out the words who shall dwell on thy holy hill page 14 He who walks in righteousness, all his actions just and clear. Now we are following God because we love him and we're saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. So we want to sing 
Mine eyes upon the Lord continually are set because we count on Him to take our feet out of the net and we want Him to show us mercy. And because we have many foes and we have many trials in our lives and we've got the incidents to prove it from one thing to another going on, the point is, we pray out Psalm 25. And you ask him to relieve you from distress because these are hard times coming upon us now. And there will be affliction by the authorities. So sing out and ask God in song to relieve you from distress both the present distress and the coming distress. Sing out. seated. Yes, we have our eyes continually set on Father and on Father's ways, and we ask him to help get our feet out of the net and keep us on the straight and narrow. So these are hard times coming up. You want to keep in mind that particular particular petition to God of Psalm 23, and you might want to study that psalm after the broadcast. You know we're we're grateful and thankful to Father for giving us the obedient Church of God, because this is the only place to be. It's the only congregation in the whole world that is following God's Bible. And we can say that on the authority of the Bible because of the test commandment of the Sabbath day. You've got to realize God is restoring all things through the obedient church of God. That's why we will be celebrating New Month Day either on the 20th or the 21st coming up in two days, two to three days. 
But all the other churches are not following New Month Day. They are not following Ezekiel 46.3. They are picking and choosing what parts of the Bible they want to follow. Well, we follow all of the Bible. And we're grateful and thankful for God to have shown us that. And indeed, he does show us more and more. Now I should get right to the topic I promised you of who will be the guests and who will be the bride. Now we had just celebrated the seven days of unleavened bread, you know, and that does picture that we are no longer to walk in the old ways, but in to walk in the true ways of the Bible. You now you cannot continue in sin. <laughs> That would be spurning the sacrifice of Christ. That would be denigrating Christ's sacrifice to continue walking in sin. You no longer continue in the old ways. Now the previous sins should be repented of. Go to Romans 3.25 Romans 3.25 Whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. 26 to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Yeshua. So we don't boast, but we follow God's way. And that's part of the law of faith. That's part of the law of faith. Now, we're faithful because Romans keep reading, because this is where people go wrong. They don't read to the end of the chapter. Romans 3.31, 31, do we make void the law through faith? Certainly not. On the contrary, we establish, we obey the law in our minds, you know. I've got a notation here of Jeremiah 31, 31. So let's see what Jeremiah has to say on this, because it all fits together. Behold, that means, hey there, look at this, behold. The days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant made with their fathers in the days that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Dot, 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 dot. 33 is the punchline. I will put the law in their minds and write it on their hearts. That's what the new covenant is. The law being written on your mind, on your heart. And put the law in their minds. That is the new covenant. It says so right here in verse 33 of Jeremiah 31. You can't get around it. It says, I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. Who said that? Says the Lord. I will put my law, law, law in their minds and write it on their hearts. Now that should give you a clue about who is going to be in the kingdom. It'll be people that follow God's way of life, God's law. And every kingdom has laws. 
And if you take away the laws from New York City in a blackout, in 10 minutes you've got rape, murder, robbery, chaos. Every nation has laws, so you don't have Irish Protestants killing Irish, Irish Catholics and vice versa. Well, we're no longer to work to walk in the false ways, no longer to continue in the old ways, but to walk in the true ways of the Bible. You're not supposed to walk in your old ways. For you who like the New Testament, I just read to you of Romans 3.31, where you don't make void the law. It couldn't be any clearer than that. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 5.8. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with old leaven, nor with a leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And the truth is if you ministers say you follow this Bible, then you'd better follow the fourth commandment, Remember the seventh day to keep it holy in the whole world and not half the world. Because it's total insanity for you, the ministers, to be following an 1883 international dateline that moves God's Sabbath to Friday. Have you lost your mind? You move God's Sabbath day to Friday. Are you crazy? It's a fact. In 1882, everyone waited for the sun to go down in the whole world. 1883, woof, the day jumps to Friday in half the world, the Sabbath day. Fly out of LAX to Los Angeles International Airport to Australia, poof, the day jumps. Fly back from Australia to LAX, poof, the day jumps back again. It's not true. You have to wait till the sun goes down. Well, people who keep the Days of Unleavened Bread are supposed to be coming out of sin and examining themselves. You ministers are supposed to examine your ways. One of those ways being not to move God's Sabbath day to Friday. Remember I told you, Jesus didn't say, after my death, move the Sabbath day to Friday in half the world with an international dateline. What's wrong with you ministers? Why can't you realize what you're doing? You know, you're not supposed to be of two opinions and trying to, you know, get away with what you can. You're not supposed to be trying to slack off. You're supposed to be diligent. You're supposed to be diligent. We're coming into the end time, and yet ministers are not repenting. They're not repenting. And this is a work of restoring all things, and any minister who says we haven't restored anything is a damnable liar, because we have over 200 people in Pakistan that are celebrating the Sabbath day properly and we've got associates in Australia and in the Philippines and indeed even in India. Now, you ministers will not, not, not be in the place of safety because you will be part of the great multitude who will have their heads cut off who will come out of the Great Tribulation. And that's what happens to people that are disobedient, whether they be ministers or not. Now, it even gets worse. You know, in Revelation 21, 27, it even gets worse that you ministers by no means shall enter the kingdom because you're causing a lie. You're causing a lie that the Sabbath day is on Friday by, phone, by following a phony international dateline. The devil's got you tricked and you refuse 
to repent. And indeed, you've refused to follow Ezekiel 46.3. You shall worship on New Month Day. And Isaiah 66.23, the whole world will worship on New Month Day. But you ministers say you won't. Give your head a shake. Well, you members are in trouble too because you won't be in the kingdom if you practice the minister's lie. In Revelation 22, verse 15, clearly says, but outside are dot, 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 whoever practices a lie. Practice the, the lie of supporting your minister who moves God's Sabbath day to Friday in half the world. Pay tithes and offerings to the Pope who moves God's Sabbath day to Sunday. Pay tithes and offerings to your minister who moves God's Sabbath day to Friday. There's no difference. Well, you're practicing a lie because you're supporting a liar and they refuse to repent. It's a sad, sad situation. Now we have Pentecost coming up and Pentecost is going to be on a Monday this year. It changes days every year depending on the calendar, on the sacred calendar and you count seven weeks, you don't count seven Sabbaths. You know, Leviticus 23, 15. Watch out for those translators. Those translators have a habit of fouling things up and getting the wrong translation. And the correct translation is weeks, not seven Sabbaths. Let's give it to you. So we get that first straight for Pentecost. Before we start telling you about the two loaves and the two groups of 144,000, let's get the basics down straight. English Standard Version of Leviticus 23.15, you know, God's Law. You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath. What Sabbath? Then the day after the Sabbath, which is the first day of unleavened bread, is a Sabbath. It all fits together very nicely. You start counting your seven weeks from the day after the first day of unleavened bread. Let's read some more translations from the New International Version. From the day after the Sabbath, which is the day of unleavened bread, first day, which is the Sabbath, because it does say the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, count seven full weeks. Weeks, not Sabbaths, weeks. New Living Translation. From the day after the Sabbath, which means unleavened bread, the first day of unleavened bread, which is the Sabbath, the day you bring the bundle of grain to be lifted up as an offering, you know, that's the first wave offering, count off seven full weeks. So that tells you what this, that it's not the seventh day Sabbath. It tells you the first day of unleavened bread when you bring your bundle of grain to be lifted up as a special offering. Got a whole list of the proper translations. Holman Christian Standard Bible. You are to count seven complete weeks starting from the day after the Sabbath. International Standard Version, starting the day after the Sabbath, count for yourself seven weeks from the day you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. So that confirms that it's the first day of unleavened bread. The NET Bible, you must count for yourself seven weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day you bring the wave sheaf offering. God's Word translation counts seven full weeks from the day dot dot dot. Enough said. Even the Catholic Bible, the Dewey 
Rames Bible, D-O-U-A-Y-R-H-E-I-M-S Bible. You shall count therefore from the morrow after the Sabbath wherein you offered the sheaf of first fruits seven full weeks. The Darby Bible translation, and ye shall count from the morning after the Sabbath, from the day that ye brought the sheaf of the wave offering, that's brought on the first day of unleavened bread, seven weeks. So the preponderance of evidence here is to be counting weeks, not to be counting Sabbaths, or else you, if you were to start counting Sabbaths, then you'd have a dead period from the time of the first day of unleavened bread till the week next weekly Sabbath happened, where you wouldn't be counting anything, and that's not correct. So use your head and follow the majority of the translations. So you'll have Pentecost on the 25th of May, which is a Monday. That's when Pentecost is. Now, you know, with those seven weeks, that does show completeness, because God uses the number seven to show completeness. You know, they're, bear note, well, they're seven days in a week. Let's really get it easy for you. Exodus 26, seven days in a week. Seven days of creation, Genesis 1. Seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. Seven candlesticks, Revelation 1, 20. Seven days of the Feast of Tabernacles, in Leviticus 23, verse 34. And the seven days of unleavened bread. Very important, and now you've got seven weeks. You have to count the seven weeks. We try to make things simple for you. Now this is also known as the Feast of Weeks, not the Feast of Sabbaths. It's called the Feast of Weeks in Exodus 23, 16, also known as the Harvest. There's more information. This is so basic, but we have to get it straight that it's weeks, weeks, weeks. And the Feast of Weeks is a symbolic festival. That's for the new listeners out there. Bear note, the Feast of Weeks is a symbolic festival which pointed to, you should know this, what does it point to? The coming of the Holy Spirit. The coming of the Holy Spirit. It points to something. And the Spirit was given to the disciples. So it's not seven Sabbaths, so that no one makes that mistake. Go into Leviticus, say it again, 2315. From the day after the Sabbath, which is the first day of unleavened bread, because that's when the wave sheaf comes, you shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath. I hope that makes it perfectly clear for you. There was so much confusion with Mr. Armstrong. You know, when he originally started off, Mr. Armstrong had Pentecost on Savan 6, S-I-V-A-N 6. You can fall on 4, 5, or 6, but let's just say 6. And that was in 1934. By 1937, Mr. Armstrong fell off the rails three years later, fell off the rails, and switched it to a Monday. To a Monday. But God started the original church, Radio Church of God, having Pentecost on Savan 6, the same way we in the Obedient Church of God have Pentecost on Savan 6 the way you're supposed to. 
Then in 1972 to 1974, you know, go into 1974, and Mr. Armstrong changed it to Sunday. Sunday. Not good. It should be Savan 6. And it has to be observed on the appointed modem, the appointed time. Now the term Pentecost in Greek, you all should know, know this, pente is a Greek term, Pentecost, meaning 50th. And it's derived throughout the Bible from where I'd read before, and you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, that's the first day of unleavened bread with the wave sheaf. Now we're in a spring harvest period. We're in a spring harvest period, which is very important for all of us picturing the first fruits of God's harvest. Bear note, this spring harvest is symbolic of all of us who are being called and prepared for entering the kingdom, for leaving this present evil age. You know, Galatians 1, 4, present evil age. And we are the first fruits that God is calling to salvation at this time by giving us his Holy Spirit. So who are we? Well, Paul explains it. Paul explains who we are. Bear note. In Romans 8.23, we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, that's what Paul says, we, that means you and I, we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. Romans 8.23. So it says, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. And we are giving you the understanding of the richness of the gifts of God and we giving you the under we'll be giving you more understanding of the wave sheaf and of waving the two loaves. That's important. I'll just say now that the wave sheaf was on the first day of unleavened bread. But we want to discuss Jesus was the wave sheaf, by the way, on the first day of unleavened bread. I, I'm not going to get into all of that because I want to get into us. Because there are a lot of people out there that are stumbling around on the wrong day of Pentecost. And we want you to follow God's Bible. It's important for you to follow every jot and tittle. And we've read all the scriptures that say count 49 days, which is as count seven weeks, weeks, weeks. And it's from the first day of unleavened bread when the wave sheaf was waved, symbolizing Christ. Now, we are very special to God. Psalm 119, verse 165 tells us, Nothing causes them to stumble. Bear note, circle the word them. Nothing causes them to stumble. Now your ministers are causing you to stumble by having the Sabbath day on Friday by refusing to follow Ezekiel 46.3, by not having God's new month day, a worship service, and a day of rest, and by not having the 
for fast of the Lord in Zechariah 8.19. Now, we are taking away the opportunities to stumble. We're taking, bear note, we're taking away opportunities to stumble. We're taking away the stumbling blocks is a better way to say it because it's not an opportunity if you stumble. We, the obedient church of God, are taking away the stumbling blocks. We're restoring all things. Psalm 119, 165 tells us nothing causes them to stumble. Now, who's the them? Okay. Well, if you read in Revelations, you'll find out that they are righteous. The ones who don't stumble are the ones who are righteous by unspotted. Now, let's get right in before we run out of time here to the two loaves, because that's who we are. We're one of those loaves. And I will tell you about which loaf we are. Let's make this simple first. There are two loaves and those are the two groups of 144,000 that are waved before the Lord. So let's, let's think for a second here. And if you go into Leviticus 23 and 17, that'll be important for you to start off here. Let's go into Leviticus 23 and verse 17. You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves. Have you got that? Two loaves. Two. Two loaves. And dot, 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 they shall be baked with fine flour and they shall be baked with leaven. Oh, so that's us. Now we're trying to unleaven ourselves. They, but here's the punchline. Leviticus 22, 17, they are the first fruits to the Lord. Okay, so the, what, what are these two wave loaves? What are, question, what are the two wave loaves? Answer, they are the first fruits to the Lord. So you know some facts here. Leviticus 22, or 23, 23, 17. There are two loaves. And they are the first fruits. So get your pen or your pencil and underline the first fruits as I'm underlining it, because that's important. And then underline two loaves. So look at it. Now, now look at what you've underlined. You've underlined the two loaves, the first fruits. That's what your Bible says. The two loaves are the first fruits. So, that's pretty clear. You can't, can't get it any clearer than that. The Bible says the two loaves are, are, are the first fruits. Now, let's tell you more. There are the twelve tribes of Israel, as named of the 144,000. So, let's take you through this so that you can understand the difference. Now I got so many notes here. I think the easiest way to handle this would be just to go into Revelations. 
I know one's in Revelation 7 and one's in Revelation 14. So let's go to Revelation 7 first. Okay, now let's see. About the 144,000. In Revelation 7, you'll, you'll see in Revelation 7, verse 3, sealed the servants of our God on their foreheads. So, Revelation 7, verse 3, you, you see you are sealed on your forehead. Now, who's sealed? Verse 4 tells us, And I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel. So that goes all the way back, you know, to Noah and his family, all the way back, 6,000 years, 24 people a year. Now let's go, keep your finger here in Revelation 7, and then turn to Revelation 14. And in Revelation 14, verse 1, Then I looked, and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000. Now this time it's on Mount Zion. Now who's going to meet Christ in the air? Eh? Who's going to meet Christ in the air? This is a different group. This is a different group. The first group was the, comprised of the 12 tribes of Israel in Revelation 7. Now in Revelation 14, you're looking, you know, at the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, and there's 144,000 with him. Go down to verse 4. These dot, 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 these were redeemed from among men, not from the tribes of Israel. Bear note, these, it does not say that they are redeemed from the tribes of Israel. Verse chapter 7 said, verse 4, of the tribes of Israel. But in 14, verse 4, it says, from among men, from the nations, being first fruits to God and the Lamb. And they're on Mount Zion with the Lamb. And we're going to meet Christ in the air. So you can see there's clearly two groups. There's definitely two groups. One of the twelve tribes of Israel, and the other is from among men, and not from Necessarily the twelve tribes of Israel being first fruits to God and the Lamb. Now there's another key. There's another key. Verse 5. They are without fault. They are without fault. Now this should be very important to you. Because you want to be without fault. You don't want to be practicing Mother Goddess Day, Sky Father's Day, Turkey God Day, because then you are blemished and with fault, because you're learning the way of the French or the Italian or the American. And you are not to learn the way of the Gentile. You are to only learn the ways of your Bible. Period. So now you see that they are without fault. The Bible says clearly, in verse 5, they are without fault. Remember, the bride presented herself white and pure. Father is not going to give a filthy bride to his wife, to his son for a wife. God is not going to give a filthy spiritual whore to his 
son for a wife. So now let's go back to Revelation 7 and look at verse 9. This is another group. This is a third group. A totally different group. Revelation 7 verse 9. After these things I looked and behold a great, great multitude. No one could number of all nations, tribes, peoples, and tongues standing before the throne and clothed now let's go. Who are these? The Bible tells us. You know, the exegesis here is that the Bible tell us. Verse 14. Who is this great multitude? Verse 14. And I said to him, Sir, you know, so he said to me, These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. So they're not in the place of safety. And it doesn't say just tribulation, it's the great tribulation. So it's the ones that come out after the first three and a half years. And they've given their lives. They've given their lives. They've had their heads cut off. Because they've come out of the great tribulation and had to wash their filthy robes and let me tell you, they'll be the guests. They will be the guests at the wedding. Now that'll shock some of you. But there is the bride, and there are the guests. Now the bride makes herself ready. The guests have their heads cut off and by that they at least end up at the marriage supper by giving their lives. But that's a very foolish way to get to the marriage supper by having your head cut off when all you've got to do is be called of God and wash, be without spot and blemish. Let's just say, we're washed in Christ's blood, but there's more to it than that because you've seen the three groups. So i got to watch the terminology that I use. All right, we're all sinners. We're all washed in Christ's blood. But here we're seeing the way I've shown you that there are three distinct groups. The first group, just to review for you, of 144,000 from all of the 12 tribes. That's in Revelation 7, verse 4. Then you go to Revelation 14, you'll find another group of 144,000. And they are with the Lamb on Mount Zion. Totally different. And they have not defiled themselves with women, with churches. Verse 4 of 14, chapter 14 of Revelations, says these are the ones who are not defiled with the churches, for they are virgins, spiritual virgins. They don't follow Mother Goddess Day. They don't follow Sky Father's Day. They don't follow Turkey God Day. They don't move God's Sabbath day to Friday in half the world. Instead, they follow God's new month day of Ezekiel 46.3. Instead, they follow the four fasts of Zechariah 8.19. Being the first fruits to God and the Lamb. In verse 5. They are without fault. They are without fault. Now, do you want to be a guest or do you want to be the bride? 
Do you want to have to have your head cut off in the tribulation? Or do you want to be counted worthy to escape? It's your call. God has raised the obedient church of God to help you understand these things of the two loaves for the wave offering and why they are two loaves because they are the first fruits. I hope that makes it clear for you. But study it. Study it. I don't expect you to understand it all on just one broadcast, but I want you to reflect on the two loaves. I want you to reflect upon the two loaves because this is a mystery that I'm revealing the truth for you. No other church has this teaching on the two loaves. None. Nada. Nyet. Zero. No other churches understand why there are two loaves. No other churches understand the great multitude. That's in verse 4 of Revelation 7. Verse 14 of Revelation 7. These are the ones who come out of the great tribulation. Now, obviously, if you're in the place of safety, you will not be having to come out of the great tribulation tribulation. Now, in conclusion, there are three groups, three groups. There are the twelve tribes of Israel, which is in Revelation 7, verse 4, where it clearly says the twelve tribes of Israel. Then in Revelation 14, verse 1, there's another 144,000 that are standing on Mount Zion with the Lamb. By the way, they learn a new song. And only they, only they can learn that song. You see that in verse 3. And they were the ones who were not defiled by false churches, false religions, for their virgins. Then there's a third group, look out. And that's the great multitude. And turn back to Revelation 7, verse 9. Of all nations. And when you identify them in verse 14 of Revelation 7, these are the ones who came out, out of the Great Tribulation. So there you have it, a totally new rediscovered doctrine for you that's been in front of you all this time in your Bible. And the mystery of it has never been explained to you before, who these three groups are and how it fits in with the bride how it fits in with the bride with first at every wedding you have br have a you have the bride and then you have the guests so obviously the guests will have to have a degree of righteousness and all our own righteousness is filthy rags, but I am actually explaining this to you in a manner which you can understand why Revelation has the three groups. And you cannot deny that Revelation has the three different groups. I've made it explicit for you, for you to understand the three different groups. Now you meditate on this for a while. Because during the days of Pentecost, today is like the 13th day of the top count of the Omer count. 
An omer is a measure of grain. I hate to have to tell you this, but a sifferote count is not anything to do with an omer. Omer is a measure of grain. So there's one minister calling, using the Kabbalah, and having a sifferote, having a count using the sifferote for all the 49 days of leading to Pentecost. That is so satanic. Every occultist in the world uses the Kabbalah. The occultists use the Kabbalah. They try to get strength by themselves without Yeshua, without Jesus. They try to just improve themselves. This minister has got all his members following the writings of the Satanic Kabbalah. It's unbelievable. Would you follow a minister who has doctrines out of the Book of Mormon? Another Satanic book given by automatic writing? The Book of Mormon was given by automatic writing by an angel devil named Moroni and dictated it to Joseph Smith. The same type of automatic writing happened with the Zohar and the Kabbalah. And yet you've got a minister who's gone into the Kabbalah, and I heard he's even printing out parts of the Kabbalah, which is a satanic book. Ask any occultist. They use the Kabbalah. So, if this minister doesn't repent, he won't even be one of the guests. He'll be in the lake of fire. He'll be in the lake of fire. Because he's doing a satanic, a satanic sifferote count. Here, bear note. He is, here's the bear note. Celebrating the supremacy of reason. Celebrating the supremacy of reason, not celebrating Christ. Not celebrating Christ. And the Sifferot is not a count. It is not a count. It, it is a tree that goes back and forth through 22 different channels like Gavir into Hod and Hod into Teferit, Teferit, Teferit back to Hod, to Malkuth. And I'm not going to get into it all because it's not worth delving into because it's all satanic. The point I want to say is that you have got to be pure if you want to be the bride. You can't be delving into satanic occult sifferote counts. You cannot. Let's, let's ask yourself. Can you ask yourself? Can you have an occult book or pages out of an occult book and still be a Christian? Still be practical? Could you? Of course not. You know, how do you feel about a minister who's giving out pages from an occult book? Zohar and the Kabbalah are occult. How do you feel about it? I'll ask you, so I don't have to preach at you. What advice would you give to a minister who is reprinting a satanic book. What advice would you give to someone who is reprinting a satanic book or portions of it? I don't have to mm, accuse anyone. I'd ask you, what do you have to say about that? How do you feel about that, that a minister is reprinting a satanic portions out of a satanic book? What do you have to say? 
What advice would you give to someone in that situation who is printing out pages from the Book of Mormon or printing out pages from the Zohar or from the Kabbalah? How would you reply? See, the, the problem is I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. You know, and week after week, I'm pleading with you to obey God and to follow only what's written in the Bible. It's important to follow only what's written in the Bible. Why is it important? Because the Bible says that if you add one practice, one word, one jot, change one jot and tittle, you'll be thrown in a lake of fire. You know, and if you cause one of the little, least of them to stumble, all you ministers, you cause one of the least of God's children to stumble, it's better that a millstone be thrown, that be around your neck and you be thrown into the sea. And yet, you want to practice the satanic Kabbalah, one minister does, another minister wants to keep on moving God's Sabbath day to Friday in half the world with a phony international dateline, another minister refuses to follow God's new month day, another minister refuses to follow Zechariah 8.19, four fasts of the Lord plus atonement. None of you ministers will be in the place of safety. So think, why is it so important for you to follow Satanism? Why is it important for you to add things to the Bible? Now we the obedient Church of God have got to get the warning out. But we're turning it around on you by asking you to ask yourself these questions. How do you feel about a minister reprinting the Kabbalah, parts of it? What do you have to say about a minister who's reprinting parts of the Kabbalah? What advice would you give to someone, to a minister? I'll put it in those terms. You will not be the bride of Christ if you don't stand up for truth. I told you. Kabbalism is the basis of every tradition under the general heading of occultism. It's based on mysticism from the Zohar. Kabbalah, bear note, let's just get it straight. Kabbalah is a branch of Jewish mysticism. And its teachings come from the Zohar. Give you it clearer. The Kabbalah will, will, will take you away from Jesus Christ. The Kabbalah will take you away from Jesus Christ. The Kabbalah nowhere mentions Jesus Christ. And it's not a holy book. It's an occult book. Enough said. The Kabbalah, I have to just say, give you the technical answer here. The Kabbalah originated around the 11th century out of occult Jewish traditions. And it's based mainly on the Sefer Yetzira, Y-E-T-Z-I-R-A-H, the Book of Creation, and the Zohar. Z-O-H-A-R, the Book of Enlightenment. That's all I'm going to say. I want to spend any more time on it. I don't like having to spend time on it. But I want you to be in the place of safety and not in the Great Tribulation. I would like you to be the Bride of Christ and not locked out of the marriage supper where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. 
And I've shown you that the bride has made herself ready. Let's find that scripture for the people that don't have computers out there. Just bring up your search engine and type in the first word Bible. And then the bride has made herself ready. Then grab your Bible. Go to Revelations. 19 verse 7 Revelation 19 verse 7 Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready Now how is he how has he made herself ready Let's go to verse 8 dot 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 for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. This should be very important to you. It's righteous acts made herself ready. If you don't make yourself ready, you are going to be in the tribulation. It's that simple. And you've seen that there are three groups of the 12 tribes. It's one group, Revelation 7, 3, and the second group, the first fruits of the Gentiles in Revelation 14, 1. And they, the key is they are without fault. They are without fault. That means the same as the bride has made him, them, them, the bride has made herself ready. They were not defiled. Verse five of chapter fourteen of Revelations. They were without fault. That's a key. That's a key to the bride making herself ready. So these two loaves are the two groups of 144,000. As proven by the scriptures I've given you, which show the distinctions between the groups of Revelation 7 and the group of Revelation 14. So there's three groups, 12 tribes, the Gentiles, and then the great multitude. The bride is comprised of the twelve tribes and the first fruits of the Gentiles. The guests are comprised of the great multitude that came out of the great tribulation in Revelation 12, 13. They did not come out of the place of safety. They did not come out with the Lamb on Mount Zion. They came out of the Great Tribulation. So the mystery of the two loaves has been explained for you. And I'm going to leave it there without getting into the rest of it where I was going to tell you about gathering together, but that's a whole other issue. Because you won't be able to buy or sell so you won't be able to buy an airline ticket to Jordan. Hmm. That ever crossed your mind? How can you buy an airline ticket if you're not allowed to buy anything? You won't be there. You won't be in the place of safety. Fair note, you won't be in the place of safety because you won't be allowed to buy an airline ticket. Now there's one caveat to that. The church might be given the wings of a great eagle. And way in the background, should God bring it to fruition, we 
could have a great eagle, a great plane to take you to Jordan when you can't buy or sell. But we'll see, it's all in God's hands. The point is that if you follow this Bible and make yourself ready by following New Month Day coming up on either Monday or Tuesday and obeying this Bible, Ezekiel 46.3, Isaiah 66.23, like the whole world will have to obey New Month Day, you start obeying you'll be making yourself ready. So I'm pleading with you. I'm asking you to ask yourself how you would make yourself ready. Hint. Obedience. Righteousness. Following this book. Every jot and tittle. And that's the sermon for today. so much more again all these files I was going to show but we got to stick to the main point drive the point home so that you can understand so I'm stopping it right there because it's so important to make yourself ready without telling you anything more about gathering together or the great wings of an eagle and all the other machinations okay let's take your song books now and we want to give our praises to Father. And therefore, what you want to do is turn thou from evil. Turn to page number 27. These are the days before Pentecost. And you should you should turn thou from evil and make yourself ready. So it fits in quite nicely. All right, page number 27, Psalm 34, Turn Thou From Evil. head bowed in humility, eyes closed in sincerity. Mighty Father El Shaddai, 
We count on you to keep inspiring the obedient Church of God so that we can prepare the people to make themselves ready so that we can prepare the way for Yeshua by restoring all of the things that Mr. Armstrong did not have the time to restore. It's all in your hands to help us keep growing in grace and knowledge. Please bless the obedient Church of God with more of your spirit so that we can lead the way to righteousness. Please inspire the teachings of the obedient Church of God so that we put it forth in such a way that the ministers start responding because they're not responding at all. The ministers are ignoring these teachings of your Bible. So help us to find a way to reach the ministers so you will have more in your kingdom and so we don't lose any of them. Father, it's all in your hands. Let it be a witness against those hard-hearted, hard-headed ministers who refuse to repent. And all we can do is keep espousing your ways. Now for the coming week, we ask for your protection, especially for our brethren in Pakistan that live in a very dangerous area where 11 of them were murdered eight years ago. So please keep protecting them. And protect us here and our members in the United States and myself from the Oh, the state sheriff troopers and the county state troopers and the local police. And the police in America, as you know, Father, kill about four or five people a day. It's never reported on the news. It's unbelievable. So, Father, please protect us from all of the machinations of Satan. Protect us for another week. Give us safety as we do our work for you and give us bless all the work of our hands and especially keep your angels around our members as they are very precious in your sight and they are following your ways of righteousness so now father we ask for your dismissal and look forward to meeting with you in two or three days for your new month day praise be to you for showing us that truth we ask this all in Yeshua HaMashiach's holy righteous name, our soon arriving King of the world and our mighty leader. Amen. Yes, indeed. We will see the works of God and we'll play out with that song because we will see him work his handiwork in the world tomorrow. And this has been... The Obedient Church of God, broadcasting from the world tomorrow.org.